What is canonics? It's a body of knowledge that was intensely debated at the beginning of natural philosophy. It was an epoch of the pre-Socratic philosophers. So we are here before 470 before Christ. Uh, people like uh, Pythagoras, Heraclit, and Thales, just to sketch briefly. In canonics, we find what we today refer to as parts of the domains of mathematics, physics, and philosophy in a kind of unity. But also after uh, Socrates, um, canonics was a very important issue for Greek philosophy. Like to give you just one example, Epicur placed canonics on the basis of his philosophy. For him, canonics was a kind of a prerequisite for successful occupation with philosophy. Canonics is a holistic body of knowledge and it's about transformation. That was developed before the specialization of domains, before ideas of sci sciences got crystallized, got developed as specific domains. In short, it is knowledge about transformation from the domain of harmonics to the domain of geometry and inversely. Literally sp speaking from music, from the music chord at an instrument, for example, to the ruler or a geometric scale. Harmonics was understood as expression of the logos and uh, in a few minutes, I'm looking very much forward, Elias will give us insight precisely in this issue of the logos and the conception of time. And he will give us sound examples, with, which I'm very eager to hear and see, of course, their respective harmonic counterparts. Pythagoras, and I show you here a woodcut, 15th century woodcut of him. He's depicted in every of the four instances. Uh, for Pythagoras, uh, this was a, a central issue of interest and development. Pythagoras himself wrote nothing, but we have evidence of his thinking and his work in uh, Nicomachus. Uh, luckily from Nicomachus, the handbook of music survived the centuries. More than anyone else in antiquity, he was responsible for the popularization of Pythagorean achievements in that what then started to turn out mathematics and the sciences. The handbook of music gives the canonical story of Pythagoras' discoveries of the whole number ratios with correspondent to the basic concordance in the intervals of music. And here at the left upper part quarter of the image, you have a depiction of the anecdote, how Pythagoras come to the idea. He passed by a smith and heard how different hammers were used in order, in order to form metal. And the sound, the very sound of the hammer was the inspiration for Pythagoras. This is at least what the anecdote says. But you also see Pythagoras here playing with certain in instruments, one of which uh, to the upper right is the glass harmonica or on the lower left, you see him playing the monochord, a kind of instrument which got nearly forgotten. Like the body of knowledge of canonics itself. Pythagoras had found it <coughs> that the basic intervals in a musical scale can be described using numerical ratios. Generalizing from this, the Pythagoreans postulated that the entire universe is built according to geometrical and numerical specializations that harmonize with each other at every scale. Historian 
George Hersey has argued that such Pythagorean ideas were developed further by the Neoplatonic philosophers and architects of the Renaissance. Nicomachus, that I mentioned just before, was not concerned with the musical practice, but he was concerned with pure reasoning that can reveal about the properties of the rationality, imperceptible and unalterable systems of quantitative relations. And here we see with Nicomachus precisely how mathematics starts to crystallize among this, let me call it, a holistic body of knowledge in canonics. Nicomachus' interest is more on how canonics can be introduced to produce a spectrum of harmonics which give rise to a scale that then can be called the canon, as the particular spectrum has a scale in itself due to the proportions in it. Now, scale and proportions, these are terms that are, as well as the canon, are very familiar to architecture and architecture thinking and development. Concerning architecture, canonics is about transformation, providing measures to go from one domain to another, that may be from geometrical rela relations to sound relations to chromatic relations. It allows to analyze and synthesize how things join together. The way how things join may be consonant or dissonant. I show you some examples how that knowledge had been utilized in architecture. From Vitruvius, providing many of the basic principles for architecture, we have the description of the order of columns. They not only define the proportions of the columns themselves, but they serve as a system to compose the whole of a building. In this sense, we find canonics inscribed into the system that de drives generations of generation and evaluation of architecture thinking. The canon, the canon of architecture as a subset of canonics. In architecture, as well as in other arts and crafts, the canon serves as a body of rules. For the domain, the body of rules produces a common, a common standard of principles, values, and questions that derive from the canon. Knowing that those rules and the applications turn people into professionals in the very domain of those rules and practices they master. And of course the statement itself that I just did is part of the canon of architecture. As the validity of the concept of canon of architecture frequently is questioned and neglected and this again might be understood as part of the canon, to deny the canon, or neglected in total, like theoretist Charles Jenks, to name but one, would argue for. Nonetheless, the canon provides standards that are understood as being axiomatic and universal, at least for the specific domain, and I stay with architecture in this concern. But this concept of the canon does not apply to some other uses of the term, which I'd like to separate from our discussion and make clear that this is a usage of the same word, which would be the classical rules of the Catholic Church that bear the same name. And uh, the same is true for the use of the notion of canon as a contrapuntual piece of music, one that we all sang in school together with our classmates, a kind of music piece in which a melody in one part is imitated exactly in other parts and vary the pitch. Here the way how the repetitions are set and how the pitch is varied, the structure of the particular canon is set. Now, is canon something that has, is canonic something that had vanished with antiquity, leaving only the various canons in all kinds of domains? In classical architecture, canon <coughs> as the discussion of proportions is applied, as we see here. But this went way farer. The fascination with the mathematical structure of antique architecture inspired many 
to describe architecture as frozen music. For example, Friedrich Schelling called in his lecture on the philosophy of arts at the beginning of the 19th century, 1803, the architecture as erstarrte Musik, frozen music. Or Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in 1833, just a bit after, half a generation after Schelling, called it verstummte Tonkunst, muted sound of art. So, one was aware of the potential of canonics to transform, while the term itself got lost, or at least in the background. The question how to translate musical compositions into architect configuration prevailed. Just, let me just briefly show you two examples of such transformation. Both are canonic works for the concept of architecture, especially from the Bauhaus period, which produced a big part of the canon of modern architecture. One work transformed sound to abstract geometry and from there to color. The other work transforms music into sculpture. Glod Brechton, at the turn of the century, an architect, suggested that architecture is merely the fixed materialization of ephemeral, ephemeral sound patterns. He followed an idea from canonics in deriving architecture from music, involved translating the tone intervals into a melody to numbers, which would then be interpreted as spatial systems. Dissatisfied with traditional translations of music into architecture, Bracton went on to construct an instrument that translated a musical score into moving compositions of colors projected <coughs> onto screens or, and here this is a big spectacle that Bracton did in 1916, the cathedral without walls, a sound and sight spectacle in the Central Park, New York. Inspired by Bracton, musician Thomas Wilfrid pulled the idea even further. He built an instrument called the Clavilux, who is also known as color organ where Bracton's four-dimensional designs would be translated into motion by using all kinds of material sensitive uh, to color. Up until the 50s, Wilfred constructed a number of different claviluxes. Here you see one with a about two foot uh, square screen, roughly square screen, in a decorative cabinet. And we'll have with this cabinet a kind of precursor, not only of multimedia art, which we already find with Bracton, but also with the television. Wilfred did large scale concerts of light patterns, where the patterns and motions correspond to the music played. While at this time the term canonics was already nearly forgotten, he transformed sounds to abstract geometry, to color according to the ancient concept of canonics. The second example comes from Hendrik Neugeboren. He did a monument to celebrate Bach. In, 18, in 1928, Neugeboren followed again the idea of transforming music, but here into an object in space. He worked in a kind of quasi three-dimensional notation, which you see in uh, the sculpture that is that you can uh, visit in Weimar today. Uh, he used the measures 25 to 27 uh, from Bach's Fug in E flat minor of the well tempered uh, clavier, book number one. In Neugeborn's system, you see in his sketch in the upper uh, right, uh, you see how he transcribed the music firstly into a two-dimensional system and then, uh, and this is the radical new idea that he uh, developed in the late 20s, into the set dimension. Besides religion and the notion of the canon 
<coughs> that has use in geometry, mathematics, physics, and computer science, which is exactly what we are going to hear about today from our distinguished speakers. So thank you for, uh, for hearing my introduction and I'm happy to welcome uh, Elias Safiris. Let me give you a short um, uh, idea of his bio. Elias holds an MSc with distinction in quantum fields and fundamental forces, a PhD in theoretical and mathematical physics, both from the Imperial College at the University of London. He has published papers on categorical theoretic methods in quantum physics and complex system theories, modern differential geometry and topology, and on many other topics on the foundation of physics and mathematics. He's also an author of two books on this subject. He's a research professor in theoretical and mathematical physics at the Institute of Mathematics at the University of Athens. And he's currently at our department, which is great, a teaching professor on mathematical thinking, which I consider a revolution in, uh, in architecture here at the TU Vienna. He will examine the Pythagorean legacy of canonics from this theoretical perspective. <coughs> 